All righty then. Um, if you haven't had a chance to go grab a handout, they are available out in the back, so you can go grab those real fast. Hurry back in while we get set up here. <clears throat> Everything good, Mom? All righty. So what do we think of that one? Any thoughts? What are we feeling? What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> y'all y'all kind of still confused on who's who? <laughs> who's supposed to be who? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The, we're still trying to figure out the uh, subtitle situation. We don't know how to adjust the, the picture up there so you guys can f- really read. But, um, yeah, anyway, so... Episode two, that was it. Um, We are continuing on in our study. Uh, This study is called What Does It Mean to Be Chosen based off of the series The Chosen. Uh, Last week, we figured out or we learned after watching the episode what it means to be chosen means that you are called. And today, uh, the title of this lesson, uh, What Does It Mean to Be Chosen? It means that you are to rest. You rest. And this comes from our source uh, passage, our main passage of scripture, which is Isaiah 43, 2. Here's what it says. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. So, Much like I did last week, and this will probably be um, how I continue on throughout this series each week, because we have a limited amount of time following each of these, I'm just going to try and hit the highlights, kind of hit the main themes that we find in the episode we just watched. Now, having said that, I do need to make one quick announcement about our upcoming um, our upcoming Wednesday nights. Uh, next week is VBS. We will not be having our Bible study on Wednesday night uh, because this place will be all decked out in VBS stuff, and so uh, this sanctuary will be uh, taken up at that time. But we will be having it the next week. The next week we'll do episode three, so not next Wednesday, the Wednesday after that. Um, also, I won't be here for that one. Um, I am going on vacation, or vacation, I'm, I'm going to suffer for the Lord in Hawaii. So you guys pray for me. Uh, yes, I know, we have to go where we are called, even whenever we don't like it. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding, I get to go see my, get to go see my in-laws, and it's going to be fun. Uh, but Dad will be doing episode three for you guys, he'll be running those study times, so that will be in two weeks, and then I'll be back for episode four the week after that. So that's just a quick aside to prepare you uh, for what's coming up in the next few weeks. Um, anyway, so I'm going to be hitting... Each week, I'll be just be hitting the main themes of the episode. And the first theme, to get it out of the way, is a very easy one. Um, it's kind of the central, the central point of this episode, and that is the theme of rest. The theme of rest. And I, I have a question for you guys as we kind of look into this one. Um, how would you describe our society's understanding of the term rest? How would you describe our society's understanding of the term rest? Vacation time? Okay. Sleeping? That's a good one, Margaret. In fact, I think we're going to get into that a little bit. But sleeping, that's one, that's one way of understanding rest, of how we do it. Anything else? How would you think, how, we as a society, we as a people, we as a culture, how would you say we understand what rest is? Not working. Jacqueline? Hmm? Binge watching TV shows. TV shows like The Chosen. You can watch the whole thing in half a day. I figured out several times. Um, (laughs) That's right. Binge watching TV shows, chilling out on the couch. Anyone else? Cuddling your dogs. That came from one of our youth girls. Um, Yeah. What was that? Okay, that came from another one of our youth scores. I'm sure it was something sarcastic, but who cares? Um, (laughs) No, 
Chicken or cuddling your chickens. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So in my opinion, if I were to answer this question, and I have answered it for you, this is the benefit of me giving you my notes. You get to see all the answers that I want you to give. They're right there in your hands. Um, if I were to answer this question, I would say that our society, people in our society, we usually fall in one of two ways whenever it comes to how we understand rest or how we apply rest in our lives. And the first way is we pervert the intention of rest by making it ultimate in our lives. And our society aids us in this in our current age of both automation and technology. Amen? So, so we, we, become, we can become very slothful, we can become very lazy, we can become very dependent because we have in our pockets something that can give us virtually anything we need almost instantly. Almost instantly, and this is a very rare time in human history where that is the case, and it has breeded a lot of entitlement, a lot of impatience, and we have a tendency in this time to really lean into what we call rest, but really what we mean by rest is slothfulness. And let me tell you something, I would definitely fall into this camp. This would definitely be my kind of thing. I am Mr. King of Comfort. My ideal uh, time of doing anything is doing nothing. Um, I love it. I love staying home. I love laying on my couch. I love taking naps. I love watching TV. I love playing video games. I love, I am the king of comfort. And so this understanding of rest is definitely one that I t most naturally gravitate to. The other second, the second idea, or the second sort of way I think our society views rest, and I would say wrongly views rest, is we kind of neglect rest. We kind of push it to the side, and whenever we think about rest, we think it mostly in a negative way. We think it mostly in a negative way. These people, um, we tend to, this is whenever we tend to only think of rest in terms of sleeping, in terms of sleeping. And whenever you're awake, you need to be going, you need to be grinding, you need to be working, you need to be doing, you need to be going, you need to be going, you need to be going. And the only time, until you, until you can't go anymore, and when you physically can't, are incapable of doing anything anymore, then you can rest by slipping into unconsciousness for a few hours. Then you wake up, and it's back to work. That's the rat race. That is the, that is the thing in us that needs to constantly be moving, constantly be working. And if we're not doing that, we're feeling like we're failing at something. We feel like we're not living up to something. We're feeling like we're not pushing right. We need to stop burning daylight, some people say. It's a part of the rat race. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Oh, first of all, let me ask you this question. Out of those two ways, which one would you say you more naturally tend to? Which, do you more naturally fall into the first one where you are all about the rest and you kind of make it pretty high in your priority list? Anybody? Is it just me? All right, well, I guess I'm the only sinner in here. Um, <laughs> is it, uh, what about the second one? How many of you don't know when to stop and you think rest is only whenever you fall asleep? Anybody? Yep. Okay. That's the one we tend to not feel as bad about omitting. Um, but yeah, so those are the kind of, the <laughs> those are the two, those are the two ways I feel like, at least in my, since me observing our culture, our society, how we fall. In neither of those ways would I say are proper biblical applications of what rest is or what rest is intended to be and what God intends for you when you rest and how you rest. The Bible gives us something that they titled this episode, something that um, you've heard them say a few times. You may not have picked it up, but some of you may have. Uh, this word called Shabbat. Shabbat is the Hebrew translation of the word Sabbath. So they're just talking about their Sabbath observances whenever they use that word, Shabbat. 
Um, that's all it means. And basically, what Shabbat, what Sabbath means, is to cease from working, to cease from working. And it's a pretty big deal in Jewish society because it's in their top ten list. You know, their top ten list. We call them the Ten Commandments, but it's their top ten list of laws. But it's number four of the Ten Commandments. And so, in Exodus twenty, verses eight through eleven, this is what. This is what the Bible records for us about the law of Sabbath. Here's what it says. <clears throat> Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So, after reading that, what is the origin of, of the Sabbath. To honor the law of God. That's right. Who started the Sabbath? When? God started the Sabbath on creation, and that is why he wrote it down into law, because we all know the story, the Genesis story, of how he rested on the seventh day. It's not that God was working himself to death, and he was like, man, I could really use a nap. Um, no, it's that he just abstained from working because he completed his work and he observed and admired all that he did. And that seventh day was the day he said to keep holy. So we use the seventh day to do the same, to observe God's work, to observe what God is doing, to observe communally together the work of God. That is the point of Sabbath. And we mainly observe that by stopping our regular daily work, whatever that may be. But that is not the primary reason for Sabbath. And that is not the primary reason for your rest. It's good to have a day off. And that is, let me just say, that is an excellent perk that God has put into his system, but that is not the only reason for it. In fact, there, the vast majority of people all have days off work, but very few people have a Sabbath. Very few people have a Sabbath. And so what makes a Sabbath a Sabbath? It's not just getting a weekend. There's got to be something more to it. So, Lucky, luckily for you guys, the second theme of this episode is the reason, the main reason, for Sabbath and for your rest. And that second theme is the theme of honor. It's what this episode is about. This episode is about honor. So, let's look at our th main verse from our main passage of Scripture, Isaiah 43, 2, again. Now just listen to this. Here's what it says. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. So here's my question. Here's my question. And you, you don't have to go to the question because they have it, but go back to that passage. Mom, go back to Isaiah 43.2, because I want you to look at this. What story in Israel's history, what story in Israel's history do you believe, just reading that verse, do you think the prophet Isaiah is referring to? Parting of the waters? Parting of the waters, the story of Moses? Anybody else? When they went to the promised land. 
The story of Moses. That's correct. Yes, you are all right. <laughs> yes, that is the story of Moses. And that is significant not only to this episode, but to what Sabbath is. But speaking of the episode, let's go to the last scene where uh, Mary is serving her Shabbat dinner. And you can see she's clearly nervous. Um, she hasn't really celebrated Shabbat in a while. Um, she was busy, you know, doing demon-possessed stuff. I don't know, but I don't think they observed Shabbat. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so this is her first time to, to observe Sabbath and observe and worship God through this, through this time. And she's clearly nervous. And there was this part in the scene that I think is, is kind of, you gloss over a little bit, but I think is pretty important. She sets out an extra seat at her table, more than the people come. And they asked her, What's the, who's the extra seat for? And she says, it's for Elijah. And they were like, no, you don't need to do that on Sabbath. That's only for Passover. And he's like, oh, okay, well, when Passover comes, I'll have, a, I'll have a head start in setting up. And we just move on. But I think that's important. And I think that's important because of what, sa- what Passover means and what Passover is. Passover, celebration of Passover in Jewish culture is understanding Jewish deliverance. Understanding how God brought them out of Egypt, part, did a miracle, imparted the Red Sea, led them through the Red Sea as they were being pursued by Pharaoh, led them into the wilderness, and then daily sustained them in the wilderness by bringing manna from above, guiding them to the promised land. And so that is what Passover means. And a little bit, that is what Sabbath means as well. That's what they're observing. That's what they're supposed to be remembering. That is important to know because you're not just resting on your Sabbath. It's not just a vacation. It's not just a weekend. It's not just a time off, but it's a time to remember, a time to remember all that God has done for you. To remember all the things in your life, all the blessings in your life, all the things that are going on, and God's hand in all of it. That is what Sabbath is about. And people think that this idea of honor is something that we're, is foreign to us as a people. But that's not the case. That's not the case. We know what honor is. We just call it something different. What was Monday? Memorial Day. What is Memorial Day a celebration of? Or honoring the fallen fallen men and women of service who have served our country. It's a day of remembrance. It's a day of remembrance what our freedom, the cost of our freedom, and the people who's paid that cost. Amen? And so we understand, we know what this is. We know what a Sabbath is and what it means to honor something with your time and honor something with your thoughts. And that is what Sabbath is supposed to be for us. It's not just a weekend or a day off. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. That part of the verse we all know, and it's one of my favorites because it gives me a license to sit on my couch. Be still and know that I am God. Okay, God, I can do that really nice. But here's the second part of that verse. Second part is why we're being still and why we need to know he is God. It's because I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So one thing about this show that you are going to um, pick up on if you haven't already. Um, every scene that Jesus is in, the, the show is stolen. Every scene that Jesus is in, he owns it. It's the best scene of every single episode, every time he shows up. And just so you know, whenever I first watched the, this, this show and I saw the first two episodes, I thought what probably all of you are thinking, I need more Jesus. Like, 
can we stop this showing up at the end for the final scene thing? Like, we need more Jesus. Um, and to that, I say, don't worry. You're going to get a whole lot more Jesus in the next episode. Um, so stay tuned for that. But my question is this. Outside of Jesus showing up at the end, what would you say was the most touching scene of this episode? The whole thing, Carol? <laughs> the whole thing, Carol? Yeah, it's a good show. Uh, it's a good episode. But no, what do you think is the most touching part of the Kyle? Kyle, did you read the notes? Okay. <laughs> Kyle is notoriously known for reading ahead. Um, <laughs> he's, he's my bookworm. Um, anyway, but yes, that is, that is, at least to me, this is, I mean, this is kind of a subjective question. I don't mean any scene could have touched you. But for me personally, that is the most touching scene is Mary's conversation with Nicodemus. Whenever Nicodemus hears that Mary has been healed, she, he, she has been redeemed from the seven demons and their oppression over her, and he goes after her and finds out what the heck happened. And so he does, and that, what is that scene if it's not just Mary talking about Jesus, talking about what Jesus did for her, talking about what Jesus had known, what Jesus had known about her and what Jesus delivered her from. That's all that scene is, and you, and you just saw it last week. You saw it play out, and you're just hearing her talk about it again, and it's like, why is this touching me like this? Why is this affecting me like this? I just saw this happen. She's not giving me any new information here. That scene is all about honor. That's all that scene is about, and that's all that she is doing, is giving honor to Jesus. Dr. John Piper, he said it like this in his book, Desiring God. He said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So I want you to, I want you to think about that quote. And now I want you to think about your Sabbath day. Who are you spending it with? What are you doing? Where are you going? What's, what's going on with your Sabbath day? Are you, are you loving your family? Are you fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you singing the praises of your Savior? Are you listening to his word? Are you seeking out the presence of God? Because that is what Sabbath is about. That is what Sabbath is for. That is what... God gave you rest for. He gave you rest so you can stop your struggling for 24 hours and you can just focus on him. Focus on his redemptive, life-changing power in your life and all the blessings that he has placed around you. Because let's be real, especially coming out of 2020, we spent a lot of time looking at all the bad things, looking at all the things that have gone wrong, looking at all the things that we wish were better, looking at the things in our own lives that we wish we could change. But Sabbath is a time. Sabbath is a time where you look at God's hand in everything in your life, from your kids to your spouse to your work to the people around you to your community of faith, and you praise God with your mind. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. When you are most satisfied in him. So, with this understanding, with this understanding of what presence is, or what rest is, and it's rest is seeking out the presence of God and honoring the things that God has done in you, let's look at our four friends our four friends who this show kind of kind of focuses in on for you to pay attention to. The, fo- the, sh- the four people that the show really wants you to pay attention to. Because these four people, these four people represent you. 
And they represent you in the story. And so let's look how their Shabbat went. How did they, how did their Sabbath go? We'll start with Mary. <clears throat> we'll start with Mary. Mary, the new, the new Mary, redeemed, healed, mended, as Nicodemus said. Her circumstances, although she's new, she is new. That is very clear from everybody who sees her. There's something different about this lady. But her circumstances are very similar. Her circumstances are very similar to what they were. She's still in the same house that the demons had her tear up in the last episode. She's still there. She still doesn't have her family. She's still by herself. She's having to eat with just a couple friends. Her circumstances haven't changed. In, in terms of that, she's still the same. But she's changed, right? She's changed. See, when it comes to rest, and it comes to biblical rest and biblical peace, it has far less to do with your circumstances and far more to do with God's presence. It has far less to do with your circumstances, has far more to do with God's presence. And so Mary, in the same house, in the same life, with the same things around her, in the same town, with the same people who knows all of her baggage and everything that she's known for, she has the best Shabbat of the four. Why? Because she has Jesus. Because she has Jesus. She has Jesus. See, Mary, everything that has gone on with Mary, she is the most honored person in Capernaum on this Shabbat. Because she's dining with the king. He came over to her house. He wanted to eat with her. Your rest and your peace has far less to do with what's going on around your life. Much less to do with the money that's in the bank, with the place that you're living, with what's going on with your relationships, what's going on with your kids, what's going on with whatever. It has much less to do with your circumstances. It has much more to do with the presence of God in your life. And that's, that's what's going on with Mary. So let's move to Nicodemus, whose circumstances are not bad, right? I mean, he's living in this immaculate home, one of multiple, by the way, because I don't know if you picked up on this. He's not from this town. He's not from Capernaum. He's a member of this Jewish Sanhedrin. That means he lives in Jerusalem. And so I, they never address his living situation, but I, I mean, I, I think it's safe to assume this is probably one of multiple homes he owns. <laughs> it could be. But nevertheless, it's a pretty nice home. It's a pretty nice place with a lot of really important people that he's dining with. This is a testament to the great success that Nicodemus has gotten that he has earned, that he has worked for, that, 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 he, that he's devoted to God, all the success he's got, gotten, all of the renown he's gathered, and everything he's worked for, yet something's missing. And you could see it on his face, right? You could see it in his interactions. You could see it how he looks at his colleagues that are there. You could see it how he's listening to his wife. There's just something. Something's not right with him. The most comfortable of our four friends, the most comfortable of the people that we're following, and he's struggling to find rest. He's struggling to find peace. He's struggling to find his Shabbat, his Sabbath. Why? Why do you think? Because Jesus isn't there. It's because what he's missing is, and what this whole thing is a testament to, is a testament to his success, what he can achieve, what he can strive for, what he can grab at, what he can do. And even though it's beautiful, 
filled with tapestries and gold and, and all these things. Even though it's beautiful, it's not satisfying. It's not satisfying. It still falls short of what he knows God to be and what he knows God honors and what he knows God to, to, to value. It falls short of that. See, the spoils of this life can never satisfy the hunger of the heart. And that's something that you young people need to understand because you're going to be tempted to chase the spoils of this life. You're going to be tempted to chase the things in this life that are shiny and the things of this life that the world tells you to value, but whenever you obtain it, it won't be enough. You need Jesus. You need what Mary's got in her little shack she's hiding out in because she's the one who's having the best Sabbath. And then we have Matthew. And then we have Matthew. And Matthew... His devotion to the logical and rational and reasonable path in his life has really led him in complete opposition to his people and to his culture. He is disowned from his family. He is not liked by his neighbors. And he is looked spat upon by his neighbors, actually. And he is seen as an amusing little pet by his superiors. And he's spending his Shabbat on the outside, eating on the ground with a dog. Now, real quick about that, because that's an important image that you need to get. Um, it's, his, it's his dog. We find out that out later. We have some people who watch the show. No spoilers. Um, you, you all have read the book, I hope, so uh, you know what's going to happen. Um, anyway, but there's an important thing about that imagery there of that last scene of, of Matthew sitting on the street eating with a dog because that is imagery that shows up several times in the Bible, believe it or not. Not, not for Matthew specifically, but this is the definition, the biblical definition of an outcast, of the people who are on the outside of God's covenant, of the people who are outside of the family of God. They are, they are, they are not in the household of faith. They are on the outside. This, in fact, Gentiles are referred to as dogs. They're referred to as eating with dogs. They're referred to as being outside of the home, outside of the household. All of this is to show where Matthew is at. He's an outcast. He's not been neglected by his people, the people of God, and he is not in. Now, before you go feeling bad for Matthew, because Matthew is the easiest character to fall in love with, Kelsey's favorite character, isn't that true? Yes, it is. Um, but don't worry, spoiler alert again, that's not the case. I think we all know how Matthew's story ends. But... Nevertheless, this is where we find him, and that is significant as well, because whenever you, whenever you know, and even someone like Matthew, whenever you know the decisions and choices in your life have led you down a path that everyone around you just doesn't want to associate with you, you're not going to find peace. You're not going to find rest, and it's going to be hard for you to live in community. And that's where Matthew's at. And finally, we have Simon. And then there's Simon. And then there's Peter. He's in a situation of utter desperation, Simon Peter. Um, I don't know if anyone has, understands the, the pressure or the hardship that financial uncertainty can give people but it is it can be utterly crippling the best way to to understand what simon what peter's going through i think is to understand a dog that is being cornered a dog that's being cornered and a dog that 
as a dog's being cornered, it is moves its mindset completely moves from anything that it once valued or once knew into soul survival mode. And whenever you're in soul survival mode, your priorities shift. The things you value shift. And the things that are least important to you fall away. And all that's important is surviving. And so, who needs to... Who needs to observe some Sabbath law when I'm not gonna when I don't know if I'm gonna be able to eat tomorrow? When I don't know what what's gonna happen with my wife, what's gonna happen with my brother, what's gonna happen with my home, with my livelihood? Why observe some Sabbath thing? Why honor God whenever I need to just live? I'm just trying to live. Here's the thing. Taking on the weight of the world, cutting corners, and believing that your way, however much it makes sense to you, is better than God's way and better than what God wants in your life, is going to lead to nothing. It's going to lead to nothing but restlessness in your soul and brokenness around you. I think the, the most striking image when it comes to Simon is not just is not the end whenever he's standing at the edge of <clears throat> edge of the Jordan and they're they're coming or the edge of the Dead Sea and they're coming. But the scene, the shot of Andrew and Eden's face as he's walking out of the door. Because it's just sheer defeat and disappointment. And that's what this does. That's what this mindset, that's what this, this type of thing does to the people around you is that whenever you feel like you need to take on the world, you need, it doesn't matter the corners you cut or how you go about your business, all, that, all that's going to do is hurt the people around you. And so out of those four, and this is something you don't have to answer out loud, but out of those four, something to think about, which... Which one of our four friends do you identify with the most? Which one of those four situations would you say, yeah, that kind of that kind of describes where I'm at with my relationship with God. That kind of describes kind of what I've been going through, what I've been struggling with. And follow-up question, something else for you to reflect on. What do you need to change in your life? to better achieve a real Sabbath? What do you need to change? Maybe it's in your mindset. Maybe it's in your schedule. Maybe it's in your priorities. What do you need to change personally to achieve a real Sabbath, which is seeking out the presence of God, which is honoring God for all the blessings in your life and to honor him? We have one more theme to get to in these last 10 minutes and it's a pretty big one because it's this is this is one that wasn't like i said this is this bible study i didn't fully write this is this is one that they the creators of the chosen with their biblical scholars compiled together and i'm just changing the language to fit how i talk um but this one i added myself this last theme because it's a theme that i noticed but wasn't in there wasn't in their bible study and it's the theme of hospitality. Now, <clears throat> it's the theme of hospitality because the scene that Jesus shows up in, the very last scene, I think it's a pretty big one. I think it's a pretty important one, especially with, with how, with how he showed up. Um... I'm going to read this again. This is Exodus 20, verse 8. Starting in verse 8. Because I want you to really listen to this. This is the, the Sabbath law. This is, what, this is what God gave to his people. God gave to Moses to write down as the Ten Commandments. This is, this is what he said about the Sabbath. 
He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. <clears throat> Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You, your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock. And listen to this. Or the sojourner who is within your gates. And I think that last part that I had underlined, I think that is a very interesting part to add into this commandment. Because it's one that I, I never read before. Or one that I guess I, I just glossed over whenever I read it. But anybody know, who is, who, who is the sojourner? Anybody know what that word means? Traveler? Stranger? If you, if you were to go into uh, Microsoft Word and type Sojourner and then right-click, it gives you synonyms. And stranger was the number one synonym. And so it is, it is, it is traveler, stranger, foreigner, person who has no affiliation with you, basically, that you know nothing about. And I think it's interesting that it is the sojourner is mentioned here. By the way, God talks about how he wants his people to treat sojourners or foreigners all throughout the Old Testament. We just, I mean, we just don't really read them very often, but the, it's all throughout. But the sojourner is brought up here. And the more I was reading this, the more I thought what a revolutionary commandment this is because of that. Because you've got to understand the times in which this was written, a hyper-tribal time where sojourners, where foreigners, where travelers were dangerous, where, 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 not, where people who weren't your people were people who were usually violent. And you were probably violent too. It was a very primal, very chaotic, very, very, again, just primal time in human history. And so this idea that in the Ten Commandments, God would say, your sojourner, they're not to do work either. The sojourner that is within your gates. And I think that's very, very cool when you consider this episode that we just watched. Because who's the sojourner in the episode? That's right. It's Jesus. Yes, he's a Jewish man. But he's not. He's observing Sabbath in a home that is not his. And, here's a little God wink at you. We know, even though he's a Jewish man, he's also sojourning coming down from heaven into our world, walking on our dirt. Not really our dirt, but you, you get the point. He's the sojourner. And he's the one who's knocking at the door. When I read, whenever I understood this, whenever I read this, the words of Matthew 25 came to me, came alive to me. Matthew 25, um, you probably know, it's the time whenever Jesus is predicting the end times, and he's talking about how it's going to be, and how he's going to have sheep on his right, and goats on his left, and this is what he says to the sheep, what he's going to say to the people on his right, the people, the righteous people who will be joining him and his father in heaven. This is what he says to him. This is what he says to them, Jesus does. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You see, God wrote this into his law. 
that we are to be a people, a generous, loving people who are, who, whose love, whose God's love in us overflows and abounds within us to every single person and everyone that we come in, con- to, in contact with and everyone who God has placed in our lives. And whenever you talk about hospitality, we usually think that means making meals. We'll do Sunday meals. We'll do, we'll do, we'll, 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 we'll do these certain things. And we, we make hospitality this very underrated part, underrated gift of a believer. But it's a very crucial gift because it's how you image your Savior. It's how you image your Savior. It's how Jesus comes alive in you and works through you with how you treat the people around you and how you treat the sojourner within your gates, within your domain. Because here, Jesus is playing the part of the sojourner. But... The reality, the spiritual reality of the gospel is you are the sojourner. You are the foreigner. And you are the one that Romans 11 says is grafted in by the blood of Jesus. That you are the one that Jesus came to save. That Jesus came to serve. That Jesus came to show the way to where his father is. To where he's from to gain access to his land, to be brought into his gates. And so whenever you are hospitable, when you are loving, when you are kind, when you are generous, when you are gracious, whenever you are overflowing in the love and in the presence of God, and we are living out this, this is the call, to show hospitality, to show to, sh- to open our doors to the sojourner. I'll close with this. And I'm doing good on time. Hey, look at that, you guys. My, my youth are really excited for me. Um, <clears throat> I always take them like 20 minutes over, but whatever. Um, they can deal. I'll close with this. In this lesson on rest, I'll close with the very words of Jesus in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's it right there. What does it mean to be chosen? It means that you rest, but it means that you rest in the presence of Jesus. It means that you find your peace, the longing in your heart, the struggle, the fear of the future, the whatever is going on with you. Your rest is not found in the amount of hours you sleep. Your rest is found in the presence of Jesus. And what I love about this passage of scripture, these two verses, is that he talks about the, the yoke and the burden. And he doesn't say that there will be no yoke and there will be no burden. Because anyone who's lived this Jesus, done this Jesus thing for longer than five minutes knows that's not the case. There is a yoke. There is a burden. There is a price to following Jesus. And in this land at this time, the price is going up. But my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you find your rest in Jesus, when Jesus is where you run to and his presence is what you seek, then it's going to be really easy to follow him. It's a, regardless of how hard it is, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So let me pray for us, and then you guys can be dismissed. Thank you so much for indulging me tonight. Dear Jesus, 
We are so thankful for you. We are so thankful for all that you are and all that you've done for us. Lord, I pray for the hearts of all of us who are in here, all of us watching online. I pray that you continue to move, continue to stir, continue to speak through us, however, however you are, God. Whether that's through this TV show, whether that's through me talking too much, or whether it's through your word, Lord, I pray through it all, you are the point. I pray through it all that you are who we're seeking, that your presence is what we're longing for, and that you are the one we find our rest in. God, it's so easy in this world to let the struggles and the heartache and the fear and the negativity and the hopelessness seep into our lives, Lord. And I pray that our hearts would be on lockdown because they're yours. And I pray that we push all of that aside whenever we see your face because you are where we find our rest. You are where we find our hope. You are where we find our peace. And we are beyond thankful for that. We love you, God. It's your name we pray. Amen.